Hi, my name is Michelle Hamilton, and I'm here with my colleague and good friend, Kathleen Bradford. We are two oncology dietitians here at the UT Southwestern Harold C. Simmons Comprehensive Cancer Center. We are both registered dietitians and certified specialists in oncology. We are here to discuss some of the most commonly asked questions from our patients. First, we'd like to quickly explain the difference between a registered dietitian and a nutritionist or nutrition coach. As a registered dietitian, we're licensed in the state of Texas and required to pass a national registered dietitian exam. Even before taking the exam, we're required to complete a 1200 hour dietetic internship. Nutritionists or nutrition coaches vary on their level of training, but typically only take an online course and receive a certificate of completion. All of this just to say, please trust your medical professional and do your own research on any online sources of information. Now let's get to it. The first commonly asked question is, what is the best diet before, during, and after treatment? And is there such a thing as an anti-cancer diet? So the short answer is no. There's no such thing as a perfect anti-cancer diet for cancer prevention or cancer survivorship. Each person has individual dietary needs that make it hard to lump everyone into a single diet. Dietitians consider a wide variety of factors when making nutrition recommendations for our patients, and please keep this in mind as we go through this presentation. If you're going through active treatment, sometimes the goal is just to manage your side effects and maintain a good energy level. For information on symptom management, please visit our oncology nutrition website or reach out to your medical team or dietitian. Instead of focusing on the word diet, we recommend a shift towards viewing your nutrition as more of a lifestyle, specifically a plant-based lifestyle. By consuming a wide variety of produce and maintaining an active lifestyle, this can reduce chronic inflammation and support immune function, both of which reduce your cancer risk. So what is a plant-based diet? A plant-based diet is an umbrella term for several diets. These diets and lifestyles emphasize the plants on your plate and use meat more as a seasoning. Instead of focusing on what you can't eat, we prefer to celebrate and emphasize the wide variety of foods that you can eat. Plant-based diets and lifestyles are rich in fiber, minerals, and vitamins, and have been proven to reduce the risk of several chronic diseases. They can also help promote healing during and after a cancer diagnosis. Examples include the Mediterranean diet, the DASH diet, which is a more heart healthy focused diet, the MIND diet, which was developed for prevention of Alzheimer's and dementia, and the vegetarian and vegan diet. Here's a good graphic from the Old Ways website, which you can visit at oldwayspt.org. This foundation has a passion for looking at our heritage and going back to the old ways of cooking. I'd like to note that the Mediterranean lifestyle includes eating meals together and remaining active. There is alcohol in the Mediterranean culture, but it's often consumed with foods, which slows digestion and absorption of alcohol, and alcohol is consumed in moderation. The AICR recommends no more than one drink a day for women and no more than two drinks a day for men, but if you don't drink alcohol, don't start. So what is the best resource for cancer-related nutrition recommendations? We strongly encourage patients to follow the American Institute of Cancer Research, which for the rest of this presentation we'll refer to simply as the AICR. These guidelines can be found at AICR.org. Here's a screenshot of their homepage. There is an evidence, this is an evidence-based resource and continues to provide updated research and information. We will take some time to review the two main goals from the AICR, but we encourage you to visit this website and sign up for the newsletter and emails. They also have additional resources for specific cancers. These can be found under the research tab and click on continuous update projects or CUP reports. This graphic is a blueprint provided by AICR. These are their main recommendations for cancer prevention and cancer survivorship. Overall, you'll see an emphasis on colorful plates that focus on plant-based meals and whole food ingredients. Let's go through the first two recommendations, which are be a healthy weight and be physically active. Number one, be a healthy weight. The recommendation is to maintain a healthy weight for your height and prevent any large amounts of weight gain or weight loss. 
Overweight and obesity is linked to 13 different cancers, including postmenopausal breast cancer, endometrial cancer, and colorectal cancer. Excess weight around your midsection is particularly harmful because it can affect your hormone levels and increase your risk of certain hormone-sensitive cancers. If you are someone who is struggling with weight loss, try to break up the larger goal into smaller time-sensitive goals. Research shows that even a small amount of weight loss can decrease your cancer risk. It isn't all or nothing. Avoid fad diets and yo-yo dieting as large fluctuations in weight can be very detrimental, detrimental to your health. A gradual weight loss of one to two pounds per week is safer and more likely to result in long-term weight maintenance. So why is excess weight so harmful? Excess weight increases your risk for type 2 diabetes and insulin resistance and higher levels of insulin-like growth factors, which can increase your risks for cancer. Although your ovaries are the main site of estrogen production in women, adipose tissue also produces estrogen. This can be a concern for those hormone-sensitive cancers. Fat cells produce cytokines and other substances that contribute to inflammation, and at that constant level of that constant level of inflammation is yet another risk factor for cancer. The next recommendation involves moving our bodies. Physical activity has been proven to reduce cancer risk. Some of the many benefits of physical activity are listed here. It can reduce inflammation, maintain our strength and lean body mass, increase metabolism, and increase gut transit time. Not only should you focus on moving your body, it is also important to think about the time that we are sitting throughout the day. Some of this cannot be prevented, but try to take breaks throughout the day. These are the recommendations from the AICR for weekly physical activity and activity for weight loss. We understand that some people are limited in what they're able to do during and after treatment. So start at a level that you're comfortable with and work with a physical therapist to safely modify your workouts. Really any bit of movement is helpful. The next commonly asked question is, can I still eat meat? So we talked a lot about eating more plants. Is it okay to eat meat or do I need to become a vegetarian or vegan? You can definitely still consume meat. Plant-based lifestyles encourage about four ounces of meat per day with some days not consuming any meat at all. You don't, you don't need to cut it out completely. However, the AICR does have a specific recommendation for red meat and processed meat as these are linked to colorectal cancer. Limit consumption of red meat, which includes beef, pork, and lamb, to 12 to 18 ounces or less per week. The ASCR encourages Americans to really limit their intake of processed meats as well. Processed meats are any kind of meat that's been preserved through smoking or curing. This includes bacon and deli meats. This is due to the, the nitrates and nitrites that are added to preserve the color of the meat. Some products now list no added nitrate, but they still contain natural sources in the form of celery juice or celery salt. Although this is a more natural alternative, it still contains nitrate and is classified as a processed meat. Not that you can't have a hot dog for the rest of your life, but keep this recommendation in mind when you're packing your lunch and grilling out. If you're struggling to think of ways to cut back on your meat intake, here are some strategies that you might find helpful. Try to use meat as a seasoning, not the focal point on your plate. Try a different cuisine. Compared to Americans in the Western style diet, the majority of the world eats a significantly lower amount of meat. Try a vegetarian dish from a different part of the world. Also try reducing the meat by half and see if you even notice a difference. You can replace this with another high protein source such as beans or soy. Lentils are a really good substitution for ground beef and white beans are a good substitution for chicken. Soy lends itself to things like kebabs and tofu scrambles and edamame is another good source of protein and cooks quickly and easily. We do recognize that some patients during active treatment are not able to tolerate high fiber foods such as beans. Please keep this in mind and consult your dietitian for additional recommendations. So here are some tips for getting started. Start with a simple meal that's traditionally vegetarian, like a vegetable soup. It's okay to make small goals and start with just one meal per week. Umami is the term for that savory flavor that we get and enjoy from meat. Add plant-based sources of umami to enhance a vegetarian dish, such as mushrooms, yeast, and caramelized onion. Here are a few budget-friendly examples of meatless meals listed on this slide. 
Next commonly asked question uh, is, is it safe to eat soy? So we just mentioned soy as a good plant-based alternative. Is it safe to eat? The short answer is yes. Current research has actually disproven the link between soy and breast cancer risk. We'll explain it in a little more detail in the next few slides. The AICR website has an evidence-based list of foods that fight cancer. We encourage you to review that list on your own, but soy is actually listed as a food that fights cancer. This is because of soy's high fiber content and high content of phytochemicals, which is a common theme across this entire list of foods. But what about the phytoestrogens? Phytoestrogens are not the same as human estrogen. There are two types of estrogen receptors, alpha receptors and beta receptors. Activation of alpha receptors promotes cell growth. Beta receptor activation slows cell growth. Estrogen and phytoestrogen are similar enough to where soy can bind or block a receptor, but soy won't activate either receptor. This is likely why we know early intake of soy foods can actually decrease a woman's risk for breast cancer. Early studies were also conducted in mice, which we know process soy completely differently than humans. Here is a summary from some of the major cancer organizations. All of this information just reinforces that soy as part of a plant-based diet is really important for prevention of cancer and cancer recurrence. So what are the recommendations for soy? Overall, it's safe to consume whole soy foods at one to two servings per day. Here are a few examples of what those serving sizes would look like. It's also safe to consume soy products that contain very little protein, such as soy sauce, soybean, soybean oil, soy lecithin, but we don't have enough research to determine if processed soy, such as soy isolate or soy isoflavins, are safe to consume. Next commonly asked question, and I think this is the most commonly asked question, do I need to eliminate sugar from my diet? I heard that sugar feeds cancer. Sugar does not feed cancer cells any more than any other cells in your body. All cells depend on glucose. Cancer cells consume more glucose because they're dividing faster than a normal cell. Unfortunately, these cancer cells are going to take these glucose molecules from your bloodstream no matter what you're consuming. However, we do know that diets high in sugar lead to other health problems. Although it's a good idea to monitor your intake of added sugars, you don't need to cut sugar out completely. This slide shows how sugar is not a simple cause and effect issue. Consuming too much sugar can lead to other health problems such as poor glucose control, diabetes, and weight gain, which all increase your risk of cancer. So what does the AICR say about sugar? There's no restriction on naturally occurring sugars like those found in fruits. However, added sugar should be limited to about 25 grams a day for women and 36 grams a day for men. These restrictions do not apply to those favorite whole fruits with natural sugars that you might be enjoying throughout the day. We have a new nutrition facts label here in the US. Thankfully, this new label includes a line for added sugar. It is much easier to track how much added sugar you are consuming from your packaged foods. You may have also noticed that the serving size and the calories are bolded now, which makes it easier to see and easier to read. So for our last and final question, the uh, from final question for oncology dietitians, what vitamins or supplements should I be taking? Do I need to take something in addition to following these diet and lifestyle recommendations? As dietitians, we are always going to recommend food first. Supplements are not recommended unless there is a likely or known deficiency that needs to be corrected, such as vitamin D or calcium. Some people may not know this, but there are some supplements that can actually increase your cancer risk or interfere with your treatment. Natural doesn't always mean safe. In most cases, supplemental nutrients, supplemented nutrients fail to provide the same level of nutrient-rich benefits as the organic consumption of the whole food. Nutrients in whole foods have a synergistic effect to promote optimal health. A vitamin or mineral supplement on its own is not nearly as beneficial as it is to consume it in whole food form. Furthermore, the contents of these products usually can't be trusted to contain precisely the ingredients listed on the label. 
Supplements have been found to contain amounts of toxic metals like arsenic. In addition, liver injury is prevalent amongst common supplement users. If you're interested in taking a supplement, please talk to your provider or registered dietitian. If you do need a supplement to treat a nutrient deficiency, we've listed a few seals that you can look for on a supplement label to show the product has gone through an additional layer of testing to prove product purity. Finally, here's a good list of resources for those who would like to do some additional research on their own. This is certainly not a comprehensive list, but these are some of the top resources that we refer our patients to. Also, if you're interested in receiving more information about the UT Southwestern Simmons Cancer Center Support Services team, please visit our website, which is bolded at the bottom of the list. This concludes the five most commonly asked questions for oncology dietitians. Thanks for tuning in. We appreciate your time and attention and hope you'll try out a new plant-based recipe this week. Goodbye.